important part of being a writer is writing. It's not going to wonderful teen author festivals, <laughs> unfortunately. It is not um, talking to your publicist. It's not filling out Q and A's. It's not seeing your deal in Publishers Weekly. Those are like, they can be nice, um, uh, but the most important part is the time you have with your words. That is always the most important part. Don't ever let anyone tell you that it's not, and don't let go of that, because that's a precious time for you to spend with your art. It's really the center of this. Like, that's why we do this, to write. So I'm at BTA Fest. I don't know if you can hear me, but um, I'm in the auditorium, waiting for the intro panel to start. I've already gotten my, like, welcome package stuff, and I've got some books that I'll show you when I get home. And uh, I'm just really excited for this whole shebang to start, so I'll check in later. someone that you would willingly suplex through a dining room table for borrowing your clothes without permission. Tell us about the sibling relationships in your books. I, you know, I think the competitive aspect between sisters is probably true. I don't have a sister, but um, I really wanted to also, they still love each other as, as the quote says, you know, you would suplex them through a dining ta room table, but they're still your ride or die. And so they still really have a really close bond, even if they're entirely different from each other. I think the uh, sibling relationship that stands out the most to me is um, Shay and her sister Sasha has passed away from leukemia. Um, and the two of them had a really close knit relationship. And the interesting thing I sort of came to realize as I was writing this novel was that, you know, just because somebody has passed away, that doesn't mean that your relationship with them is over. In my book, the main character, May, has an older brother who is nine years older than her. So growing up, they have um, more of a parental um, and child kind of relationship, um, but they bond a lot because they share this tough um, struggle with their identity where um, they feel like they can't really share um, with other people you know how strict their parents are because they won't understand but they can share it with each other and they also also struggle between you know how much of me is Chinese how much of me is American and they don't qu feel quite like they're either one relationships in YA um, what makes a sibling relationship feel real and lasting um, and like it has real truth to it to you I think the thing that makes sibling relationships feel real is the same thing that makes most relationships feel real it's that they're not meat as long as the relationship relationship is super messy. There are people doing bad things to each other. There are people apologizing for said bad things and then making more mistakes later on. I think those are sort of the hallmarks of it. The love that sort of runs through everything, you know, even, even the awful things that um, you do to each other, as long as that is apparent, 
there. Um, I think that makes a good sibling relationship. And they understand each other in a way that you know other people can't because they share so many experiences. Um, but at the same time, they have such different views on things. I think from a you know narrative point of view, right, it's really useful to have you know people growing up in the same space making different decisions. The thing that makes it feel really authentic to me is that sense of that really long shared history where you know that you can kind of shorthand certain things with your family and you can you know you can have like weird shared experiences whether you know that that inform the way that you um, respond together to things and I think that that is really pleasurable to to then bring out in moments you know, to sort of contrast whatever is necessarily going on. I also think that there is something about sibling relationships and that they're not static, they change. You know, you're all living together and generally all living together in a small family. And even if you're entirely different people, you're still kind of bound by this concept of family. Your relationship doesn't stay the same. It's not crystallized. I think those dimensions is really what makes a relationship seem realistic to me. Yeah, I absolutely, I, I always knew that there were this many kids in the family, and I think that a big part of what is useful to me about it is I get to play through a lot of different responses to the same tragedy in their family. I think there's a, a real risk in family relationships because we think that they are forever, but they're not necessarily forever, and we think that we can trust these people because you, you we should be able to trust these people. We're told we're able to trust these people. We can't always trust these people, and then maybe we can even after we can't. And so I think that is something that's really interesting yeah. to me. So we just finished the first lecture. I'm on my way to the second. It's a little bit of walking, but I'm having a lot of fun. It was really cool to hear about like how published authors write authentic sibling relationships because it mirrors a lot of the stuff that I already thought, but like adds to it, gives me some things to work on for my own WIP. So we'll see how this one goes. This is my favorite thing. You can actually register to vote here. Time, how you use it, how you go back and forth in time, and how these brilliant authors made books that like drive you crazy when you have to read them, basically. <laughs> Did you always know that shipping back and forth through time was going to be a key aspect of your book? So I, I always think like the central like the concept of the story is that you're going back and forth between two narrators and two time uh, two periods of time that are separated by a thousand years. And there's like time travel because magic. So I like right at the fantasy book, of course, time travel because magic makes it work. Um, so, uh, so I always knew from the time that I began uh, brainstorming the story that that would be the concept and that there would be a lot of going back and forth between these two time periods. So like I said, I sort of woke up in the middle of the night and had to sort of read through the entire book. But one of the... Yeah, that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Remember I was saying how like, you know, there's a fixed I believe in fixed universes. Well, I actually went to film school, so I really believe in continuity um, and screenwriting, and that actually helped me plot this book because it was. I'm very keen into like, okay, there was a red shirt in this chapter that has to be red shirt in this chapter. So that was one of the best ways I was able to actually plot this book was consider it more like a movie and bring up chapters like scenes rather than have it. Be sort of like, you know, the first act. I mean, everything is like first act, second act, third act. Um, so I was able to sort of see sort of the parts of the trees um, by doing it or producing this movie like a book or a book like a movie. In everyone's most of the sort of time travel esque moments come in the form of the protagonist sort of accessing memories that have been long buried. Um, so I almost think that not as like a plot element, but an emotional element. Like when is she feeling something that would pull up this, you know, this very memory? Um, so it was a little bit haphazard. Um, I had to move a lot of stuff around, but um, I think it turned out to be something that didn't necessarily show up in the initial outline, um, and just turned up whenever it felt right for her emotional state. I could just sit here and be like, you know, like. I outlined this really, <laughs> I was very organized and I had everything all set and I knew what I was doing. Clearly I didn't. I mean, I've already admitted that. The, I think every book is a new challenge and when you think you got, you think you figured something out in the last book, the next book will come along and be like, ha! Huh? <laughs> so um, this one did not.
not want to be planned in that same way. And so I would kind of have to do a discovery draft and then I would discover something and then I would have to go back and make everything fit the new discovery. After every draft, I would do a new Scrivener outline of just like what was happening and then I would write forward and things would change and I'd go back. And so there were a lot of different randomly color-coded Scriveners that would make no sense to anyone else with different multiverses of what this book could have been. I'm a very visual person and I wanted to see like how the story was all going to unfold and like what parallels there would be between the various couplets of chapters. So I want to have some sort of thematic parallel between the two chapters. I have this monster spreadsheet because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a plotter but this is like uber plotting. So I had a giant spreadsheet that had a column of all the chapters, um, like you know one through whatever, a real storyline and then the other half of the spreadsheet had a column going down that was two through whatever, which is Eliana's storyline. And for each, like, for each storyline, I had columns that were like, this is this subplot, and this subplot, and this relationship, and whatever. And so I would chart the course of what's happening in each chapter um, so that I could see this giant, like, map of, like, okay, so in this chapter, this development happens in this relationship. And in the parallel chapter in Eliana's storyline, like, a thousand years later, we had this development in this relationship. And Echo each other. Do I allow you to do as an author that you otherwise could not? The hardest thing is just logistics. I have a hard time this even when there's no weird time elements at all. Like one scene will be sunset, the next will be moon, like what happened, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but um, there's a town in Everless where it's 12 hours behind the rest of the world. And at one point, Jules has to you know, go in there and discover something and, um, you know. Learn, learn, solve a mystery, um, and I was like, "What happens to her horse? Like, when when you know she comes out, like, is the weather the same? Just that type of things. I kind of have to think about it too much. <laughs> <laughs> the most complicated part is actually making sure that everything makes sense um, for each chapter. Uh, and I think the easiest was sort of, I mean, at least for me, because I'm all into the continuity, you know, I'm a nerd like that. Uh, so the easiest part was actually making sure that, you know, the characters were in the same clothes and they're particularly in the right time frame. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like it's, it can be hard to be vibrate logistics of the entire process of writing this could be like such a <laughs> it takes a lot of drafts to finish the final book, right? So you, you write a version of it, and that one's not right, you write another version, and it's compa the complications are compounded when there's like a time element and like you're not telling things in order too. So I think the most complicated and frustrating part of writing this was a lot of times I wouldn't really remember what, <laughs> what happened in the version of the book that was the book that, you know. So in my mind, there were all these different things that happened that are that never ended up in the book because I cut them out. Or I changed something and then someone will ask me a question and I'm like, oh right, I needed that. In the publishing journey, uh, these debut and veteran authors discuss the ins and outs of their journeys to publication, what they've learned, and what they wish they knew. Okay, so for my first book, um, Ash, I did about four drafts before I sent it to agents, and then I did maybe three drafts, I don't know, three or four, and then uh, probably three, because then my agent had me do a revision. And then I got an editor and I did another four drafts plus page proofs, plus extra page proofs, plus a third version of page proofs. So a lot, a lot. It was like an eight year process for me from beginning to end on that book. Um, so for my debut, um, starting from scratch, I probably had um, like three or four drafts before it sold. And then after that, um, it didn't, I didn't like rewrite from scratch at that point, but it went through, you know, many different versions. And then I also wanted to point out that this was the fifth book that I had completed after getting serious about writing for publication. Sort of like you, I had a really, really long, my first book was five and a half years uh, to, from when I started it to when I got my the, the deal for, for Anger's a Gift. Um, so I'm used to like just ridiculously intense schedules. I highly don't recommend it. <laughs> uh, my answer is very much like Melinda's. It just depends on the book. I've done 11 and every single one has been different. And I am one of those writers who tends to revise as I go. So there's lots of 
you know, I can't just say one or five or ten drafts because revision is constantly ongoing. I see some nods, some of you do that too. And uh, so, but I would say generally I do two drafts before it goes to editing. And then after that, then my editor gets another couple cracks at it. And although now we kind of do a lot of back and forth and then copy editors, it seems like there's two or three copy editors that weigh in. So, mm -hmm. you know, by the time you go through many, many, many drafts and everybody's weighed in, you know, it could be seven or eight drafts. <laughs> Sort of actually along those lines, this isn't quite an answer to your question, but I think it's also sort of, it's sort of interesting. Um, when Before my book was acquired, my uh, my editor told my agent, like, we're going to take this book to acquisitions, but just so you know, Rachel will probably have to tone down some of her sex scenes. And I was like, okay, that's that's fine. I always assumed that would happen. Um, the characters are 18 and they are exploring sexuality in different ways. Um, and so uh, they acquired it and then it came time my editor was like okay now we have to do this and so i toned some of them down and she actually didn't like them um and she was like actually can you add that back in and then maybe like <laughs> turn it up a little more so um <laughs> i think that is sort of interesting because i it anticipated pushback and i'm honestly shocked by some of the stuff that i was able to keep um and, like really pleased um for sure and publishing has changed since YA was first in introduced to the market and i guess how do you think YA has changed since it was first introduced to the market, sort of on the same same vein, especially about sex? <laughs> well, YA started like in the 60s, so let's yeah. we're, maybe we don't need to go back quite that far. <laughs> uh, well, history lesson, let's go. <laughs> how has it changed? It's become much more mainstream, much more commercial. It has many bestseller lists. It has celebrity authors that and has books that get made into major international blockbuster movies. I mean. It's huge now. I mean, in the beginning, it was just, it was the outsiders. It was like problem novels in the 80s. Uh, one thing that I think is really good to know is that the finish line is always moving. And even just as a debut, like it's obviously still very early in what I hope is a career that can continue. But you think when you just start writing like, oh, if I can just finish this book. And then once you finish that book, if I can just get an agent, then I'll be happy if I just sell this book. Then, I'm, then my life will be great. And then you realize once you sell a book that there are so many other things and the finish line is just this little carrot that keeps, <laughs> someone keeps tugging it farther and farther away from you. So it's really having that one thing in your mind of like, oh, I just want to be published. Once you get to that stage, there's going to be something else. There's going to be a list that you want to be on. There's going to be an award you want. You want the next deal. Um, I, it took five and a half years for me. Um, and that's a long time when you, when. And I'll have it when I do school visits or I'll be at conventions, someone will be like, oh, how long did your first book take you? And I say five and a half years, and they're like, I'm good, never mind, that's no way. And it's like, why would I in invest five and a half years? But that five and a half years is because I had a full-time job. Um, you know, prior to this, uh, and, and continuing through it, I, you know, I mostly write nonfiction, and so I had to do that thing where I had to find little bits of time. After my job, I'd go to a cafe, sometimes on a weekend, and find little bits of time in which I could work on this manuscript. Um, and while that was happening, many of my other friends that who I was writing with had much more free time, so their path looked quicker than mine. Um, and so, so this both answers what you should do, and then one thing I wish I'd known is that you should, really should not compare your journey to someone else's. Um, and I, I, I didn't learn, I didn't learn that at all. And at the beginning, I was watching my friends get deals. I was watching them getting to go on tour, and I was like. I'm on chapter eight. You know, like it's like this thing where I was like, oh, I'm so far behind them. But the thing is, is their journey was different. Many of them published one book and then never, that was it. They don't want to do anything else. Whereas my goal was always, I want to publish books for the rest of my life. Like, there, there still is, there never has been transparency and there still isn't. Um, but every publisher is different. So, you know, the things that happen at my friend's publisher are different than happen at mine. And, but we still compare notes. Um, but one thing I would say for people just starting out on this journey is um, listen to other people, grow, be willing to change, um, develop your craft. That's one thing that we don't talk about a whole lot. Uh, all of us have strengths as writers. We also all have weaknesses. And there's a bunch of writers out there willing to share their knowledge. and. You can go to any library, any bookstore. There are books on crafts and craft, not crafts. <laughs> There's those two. Uh, I think that it's very easy to be distracted by the other industry stuff. And that stuff is, Im is important to the business of being a, an author. But a writer writes. 
So focus on the craft and focus on telling the story that you want to tell. And for the writers who are in the in the in the publishing and business industry who want the transparency, I say to all of you, let us make a pact, okay? When you want to know what is happening with your book, ask. Ask your editor, ask your agent if you're not comfortable asking your editor. Ask for facts and ask as if you were a straight white man. <laughs> so I super loved the publishing process panel. I'm going to my last panel now, um, but my phone's gonna die. So I'm gonna try to find an outlet really nearby and uh, wish me luck with that. <laughs> so I got some arcs and I'm so happy about them, especially the Boneless Mercies, but they all look phenomenal. I'll show you later. So my phone needed charging for, I'm gonna hop in here, for the duration of that last panel. Um, it is now signing time, and I'm gonna go get my book signed, obviously, and hopefully they will talk to me long enough to give you some pretty good writing advice, and then I can justify making this a Writer Wednesday video. Stay tuned for that. Do you want a book? Go for it. Okay. Hi, I'm Kirsten White, and my top writing advice is give yourself permission to write a bad job. Okay, that's yeah. it. Hi, I'm Beth Jackson. And my book, Ladies and Hi, I'm Julia Dow. I'm the author of Four Secret Eyes and Lanterns, retelling of Snow White from the Evil Queen's perspective. My writing advice would be to just write for it. Like, light a candle, eat your character's favorite food, whatever it takes to keep you in the story. Hi, my name is Claire LeGrand, and my latest book is Fury Born, the first book in the Imperium trilogy. And I also have Song Hill Girls coming out on October 2nd. And my first piece that my best piece of writing advice is take your time. Don't be afraid to take your time. Don't rush it. Take time to daydream. Take time to take breaks. It's very, very important. So BTA Fest is over and it was a really good time and I'm waiting for my boyfriend to come pick me up now because I don't have an alternative way of getting home so I figured I'd just like do a little haul for you guys like show you what I got here and like recap my emotions. So the reason I'm putting this up on Writer Wednesday is because each of the panels that I went to has some spoilery thing to do with Project Gemini and I can't wait to share them all with you. You may have guessed by now um, there was the panel on sibling dynamics. Obviously my main characters are gonna have a tempestuous relationship with one another and they are related. The panel about time and plotting that is very important because there are dual timelines in Project Gemini and yeah you know what that's that let's cut that off for spoilers. Um, besides the like usefulness of the panels I just think that all the authors were really charming and sweet and fun and events like this just always remind me how much I love the young adult book community. We got a lot of shit on all avenues of the world but like we're a strong community all the people coming here and all the authors coming here and all the event organizers for BTA Fest are super passionate about this and no one can take that away from us so I stand some YA kings queens and rulers that are not bound by the gender bound binary <laughs> so as far as book haul um, I mean I failed at my book buying ban very very severely the first book that I got was Winter Spell by Claire Legrand the person who wrote Fury Born who you may have seen earlier I also got a recommendation for a Nutcracker motion picture I am trash for the Nutcracker so I knew the moment that I saw this Nutcracker retelling I was like I need it so I have it I'm about a chapter in now and I already love it so if you're a trash for the Nutcracker I highly recommend this one I also got Forest of a Thousand Lanterns by Julie C. Dow. I've been meaning to read this for forever and this beautiful covered floppy paperback edition is just perfect. And the last book I purchased was Monday's Not Coming by Tiffany D. Jackson. It's just, it sounds so fascinating. It's like a mystery thriller about a girl who goes missing but nobody like talks about it. Nobody seems to acknowledge that she went missing until she turns up a year later and I'm just super excited about this one. I also got a paperback copy of All Rights Reserved by Greg Katsoulis and I got some arcs. I got 
Star World by Audrey Colehurst and Paula Gardner. I got an arc of The Boneless Mercies by April Genevieve Tuchulk, which is like Beowulf but feminist, and I'm like super excited for gender bound Beowulf. I also got like a compendium like chapter sampler thing, and the last one I got was The Similars by Rebecca Hanover. And just like various other swag thingies like buttons and just chapter samplers and I'm just so excited. Everything about this made me super happy. So thank you all so much for watching. If you like this video please give it a thumbs up. If you like me maybe consider subscribing to my channel but this is all I have for you today. Thank you again so much for watching and I will see you next time with a new video very very soon. Goodbye.